Kia ora Aotearoa, this is the Taxpayers Union 2023 election debate series coming live from everybody's at Imperial House in the mighty Auckland City. Hosted by the working group, New Zealand's best weekly... I can't believe it either. I saw a limo at the front door. That must mean Radio New Zealand and the spin-off are here. I am your host for this evening, the editor of the Daily Blog, Martin Bradbury. And joining me tonight is my podcast permanent panellist, the 132nd most important libertarian columnist at Stuff, Damien Grant. We are streaming live tonight on the New Zealand Herald, the Daily Blog, Facebook, YouTube and simulcast on Juice TV, Freeview 200. Brothers and sisters... Fellow New Zealanders, comrades and citizens, thank you for tuning in to this, the most important of civic duties, which is to vote. In an age of disinformation, misinformation and apathy, our democracy requires and needs engaged citizens like never before. Let's ensure that tonight we are passionate in our debate and righteous in our argument because there are only 100 democracies on earth and we are blessed to be one of them. Tonight we will debate the ideas while respecting the individual because no matter how you vote, we are all citizens and we all shake hands after the arguing. So before we begin, a toast fellow citizens to our democracy and long may we debate it. To democracy! Right, let's get into the fuckers. Right, tonight we ask Labour, National, Greens, Māori Party, New Zealand First and Act to send forward their best advocates to articulate their party to discuss the four big issues this election. Issue one, the economy and cost of living crisis. Issue two, the crime crisis. Issue three, co-governance, the treaty and extremism crisis. And issue four tonight, the climate change crisis. Folks, that's a lot of crisis for one election. Try jamming it all into a 90 minute debate. Each candidate will get 60 seconds to answer my question and Damien will challenge their answers and they will get a 30 second rebuttal to him. The reason you have 30 seconds to rebut Damien is because no one should ever have to answer to a libertarian for more than 30 seconds. Which reminds me, what's the difference between a libertarian wedding and a libertarian funeral? One less opinion. When your time is up, I will ding my bell. And in any other normal debate, that would be enough. But look at this lineup, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't a debate, it's a death cage match Royal Rumble with bets on who faints first. Paul Goldsmith or Ricardo? Can we just hey, agree hey, hey. that if David Seymour gets knocked to the ground, no one's going to kick him? <laughs> John refuses to acknowledge that. <laughs> refuses to. If we manage to get through this debate without everyone getting cancelled and sued for defamation, it'll be a fucking miracle. If candidates don't heed my bell, I have this. A gender fluid bike horn. And I'm not afraid to use it. I appreciate this may trigger New Zealand first, who will demand a gender fluid horn specific toilet. <laughs> Such a dumb policy, Jenny. Comrades, this is the gala debate of the election season, and the working group is bringing it to you because you deserve more democracy, not less. Have I mentioned New Zealand on air, aren't they? Let us begin tonight's event by introducing the advocates each party sent to represent their interests for this evening's live stream simulcast TV debate. From the New Zealand First Party, the 19th ranked candidate on their website, Jenny Marcroft. Hey. Oh my. My From the National Party, two tick Epsom candidate and man who has no idea what he's done to be picked for this debate, Paul Goldsmith. <laughs> From the Labour Party, working class Jedi and mouth of the South, Willie Jackson. <laughs> From the Ash Party, House of Slytherin graduate and man who believes Nelson Mandela would have voted for him, yes. David <laughs> I know you're not smoking cannabis because you're so, so little to smoke <laughs> bloody hey, From the Green Party House of Hufflepuff, Ricardo Mendes March! <laughs> and from the Māori Party, the Māori Malcolm X, John Tamahiri. <laughs> 
Remember, Māori didn't land on New Zealand, New Zealand landed on Māori. Welcome to you all. Let's begin tonight with a one minute opening statement from each of you on your party's vision for New Zealand. Jenny Marcraft, New Zealand's first one minute vision for New Zealand. Starting now. Thank you very much, Martin. Lovely to be here and joining oh, you on the board. Uh, you are the fifth estate. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just start off by, by saying that ideological extremism, whether it's left or right, that's probably going to be the thing that New Zealand uh, will go down a pathway and it won't be good for all New Zealanders. And currently we have a situation where people are becoming aware that this woke agenda whether it's um, racial divisive policy, is actually, we're gonna stand up to that. And on the other hand, we've got to be mindful that uh, what is looking like a hidden right-wing agenda, we need to be very aware of that as well while we're having these social debates. Uh, New Zealand First, we have a proven track record of bringing balance and responsibility to government. And that is something we are able to continue to do. We are the handbrake on bad ideas and we will accelerate good ideas, uh, no matter what side of the political spectrum. New Zealand First, we will bring uh, our forward, our social good policy, and it will also contain fiscal responsibility. It's about being in the centre, making sure that we look after people, but we take care of the finances. Thank you very much, Jenny. Paul Goldsmith, National's One Minute Vision for New Zealand. Well, uh, thank Your time you. starts now. Well, thank you very much, and it's great to be here on this uh, wonderful evening. We're going to get New Zealand back on track. Uh, that's our primary uh, vision, and we're going to do that by recognising that New Zealand is one of the great democracies of the world. It's a wonderful country. Uh, we want to see New Zealanders feel confident about the country that they live in, uh, that they uh, know that they can achieve uh, everything they want for them and their families, uh, and can know that they can be succeeded. And, uh, they know that they can <coughs> succeed and be supported by a government that understands what they need to do. We're going to restore law and order, we're going to fix the economy, and we're going to actually deliver some quality health and education. Because uh, it's not good enough, just like uh, Willie's things, to think if you announce something in a PR, that's all you need to do. Actually, you need to have uh, policies that can get the country going forward. So, under Chris Luxon's leadership, uh, <coughs> National's ready. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting the country back on track in two months' time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Willie Jackson, Labour's one minute vision for New Zealand, please. Your time starts now. Uh, kia ora tato. First of all, I want to say thank you to the Taxpayers Union. And <laughs> Jordan, I mean, I would never have believed I would have come and supported Jordan, dirty, filthy mongrel that he's been over the years, <laughs> uh, and, and never supported the Labour Party. I just can't believe I'm here, but kia ora everyone. Good to be here. The and, and, well. and the vision is, as you all know, the Labour government will look after you. We won't leave anyone behind. We've already shown that. We've shown that through the COVID crisis. We've shown that through the terrorism crisis. We've shown that through the cyclone crisis. We will look after you and your whanau. Not like this useless lot who don't know how to put the, together a tax policy or this bloke over here who wants to divide New Zealand. We are the government for you. So you taxpayers, you taxpayers, you, you, get behind us. The government loves you, we're doing it for you, even though you might not be doing it for us. Kia ora tate. It's going to be one of those nights. David Seymour, Act One Minute Vision for New Zealand, please. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks, Martin, thanks, Damien, thanks to Jordan and the Taxpayers Union and everyone who's come out tonight. Look, the truth is, folks, New Zealand's in a funk, and it's not just me saying that. It's New Zealanders by a ratio of two to one saying we're going in the wrong direction. And why? Because stuff costs so much, because they've managed the economy and especially they're spending so badly. We need to start demanding results for public expenditure and stop putting red tape and regulation on anyone who's trying to do anything good in this country. We have crime that has actually descended into lawlessness. This experiment of being kind to criminals, letting them out, hoping they'll be kind back. Guess what, folks? It failed. The numbers are there and so are the experiences of New Zealanders that are often so tragic. And this idea that our treaty is the first in the world that actually divides people rather than bringing us together in a modern, inclusive, multi-ethnic, liberal democratic state with one person, one vote, that has not been good for social cohesion and it hasn't been good for anyone's results. We can make this better. Over. There's going to be there's going to be so much fear from it's the other over. side because they can't run on their own. <laughs> Re 
Ricardo Mendes March. Greens one minute vision for New Zealand. Your time starts now. Commending you on uh, the attempt to pronounce my name. Um, look, kia ora koutou mai. Um, my vision in the Greens vision for New Zealand is actually stop the short-term thinking cycle that the major parties are caught on and the Green Party solutions are about thinking seven generations ahead, whether it is addressing the climate crisis or ending the inequality crisis. And part of why the Greens are campaigning hard for tax reform this election is because we know that everyday people are paying a greater share of the tax than the wealthiest few. And this is why we want to bring a tax switch to ensure that we align our tax system actually better with Australia and we also do our fair share to reduce emissions and also provide basic services that are adequately funded so that people don't have to live in excruciating pain because they cannot afford to go to the dentist. This is about putting the foundations for long-term change rather than getting caught up in three-year sound bites. So the Greens will put in place solutions that will leave our future generations better off than they are today. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, John Tamahiri, Māori Party's One Minute Vision for New Zealand, please. Your time starts now. Yeah, kia ora hui hui, mai nā tātou katoa. Um, uh, firstly, uh, our constitutional rights and entitlement. Uh, we are not a race-based party. We are an indigenous-based party. And racism was brought by non-Māori. Remember that, by colonisers. So all I wanted to say is, <coughs> so all I wanted to say is we are a rights-based indigenous party. Thank you very much. That's the first point. Second point is that we have a right and entitlement to self-management. Parkia has taken it for right. The ACT Party will stand up for private property rights, but steal Māori water rights. That's true. That's true. Now, what we've got to do is say, no, no, don't dress it up. Uh, see, see, the ACT Party and the National Party says everybody owns the water. Labor says nobody owns the water. We say we own the water. <laughs> now, there's no doubt about that because no one in here from a legal perspective, can challenge that. And see, that's your problem. Some of you don't like hearing the truth. And when our truth is spoken, you, you say we're racist and you, you make all these allegations. Go jump in the lake and thank you very much. Thank you, candidates. Let's start with issue one tonight and the cost of living crisis and the economy. Post-COVID build back, New Zealand has been plunged into a cost of living crisis created by the urgent need to underwrite the economy during a once in a century pandemic, exacerbated by an explosion of geopolitical frictions and global supply chain meltdowns that are literally importing inflation into the West. These global machinations are cold comfort when week after week we feel the highest food inflation rates for 30 years biting our pockets at the duopoly supermarkets or the petrol oligopoly. Oh, Every time you fill up your car or go to the supermarket, you feel mugged. We have the squeezed middle, the stamped poor and the glorified landlords. Paul Goldsmith, National will give rich landlords a $250 per fortnight tax cut funded by robbing two-year-olds, mutilating public transport <laughs> and literally stealing from the climate change funds while removing the foreign buyers ban and giving landlords the right to kick tenants out onto the street, all the while taking millions in donations to the real estate pimps. Surely the CTU is right. Chris Luxon is too extreme and out of touch. I, I, Your I, time I, starts now. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I don't think your analysis is quite correct there, uh, Bobby. Uh, uh, but on the CTU thing, of course, if a government doesn't have a, a record to uh, stand on and, and they can't run on hope, well, then they've got to run on fear, and that's why we've got the CTU doing all that oh. stuff. But in, in, terms, of, in terms of what the government's done, that, that, it, it's not difficult when it comes to rents. Rents have gone up $175 a week. And if a government adds costs onto landlords uh, and makes it more difficult to deal with uh, unruly tenants and just keeps on piling costs on, uh, then surprise, surprise, that gets, it flows through to the tenants who actually pay it. And so uh, in terms of taking the pressure off landlords, we're ultimately trying to take the pressure off renters uh, and to deal with that squeeze middle. Of course, the number one thing we're going to do is give some tax relief. Uh, the government has given relief to just about every part of society apart from people pay who that? pay the taxes. So we're going to uh, pay for it pay by, for it. Uh, thank you very much, Willie, we're going to pay for it by uh, uh, a number of uh, revenue gathering members, but also from reducing spending. It's interesting, when Labor, uh, uh, when Grant Robertson finds $4 billion behind the couch uh, last week and saves it, it's OK. When we uh, find He's some savings, uh, we're cutting and burning it. Yeah. Time, Paul. Damien Grant, your follow-up question to Paul's answer, please. Paul. 
Um, Martin, I just wish your characterisation of National Party's policies was anywhere near the truth. I mean, it, it, it warmed my heart to hear that stuff. But I want to just first address the top rate of marginal tax. Yes. So it appears to me, from my reading of your policy document, that you're not going to reduce that. Have I, have I got that correct? Uh, not in our first term. Uh, I did, we would like to reduce it when we can, but the fiscal conditions have been so badly uh, run down by this government, uh, we've got to be careful about it. So we're starting off with the middle, the squeezed middle. We're going to give them some tax relief first, uh, and then to help the, the renters uh, by taking the pressure off landlords. And then if we get a chance, uh, further down the line, we'll address other tax issues. But further, but further down the line, you're going you're gonna to potentially be in coalition with New Zealand First or somebody else who's not going to let you do it. It's like the Resolve, it's like Resource Management Act all over again. You had the chance to reduce to do the reserve bank, the RMA in the first three years, and you didn't. Well, if you don't remove that 39 cents this term, it will never be reduced. Well, if, if we're further down the line, we might be in coalition with ACT, and it might be OK, so you never know. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, Willie Jackson, many Kiwis feel bitter and burnt by post-COVID, and many still blame Labour for that pain. Sure. Voters Why? didn't see the transformation Jacinda promised. GST off my banana is great, but many feel they have gone backwards after an unprecedented MNP majority. Why should Kiwis vote Labour again? Your time starts now. Well, it's not GST off bananas only, is it? I mean, it's, it's GST off fresh vegetables. And, and, uh, no, you, you know what it is. And, and, and it's all the other things. It's about a minimum wage bomber. It's about uh, prescription uh, charges being scrapped. You know, it's about looking after our young ones. And the big one, as everybody knows, was announced last Saturday, free dental care for those under 30. That's the point here. I mean, that's a so so New, New Zealanders should trust in us. But here's the point, bomber. Under this lot and that, this lot, it's all gone. No, no free dental health for, for our for our people under 30. They'll get rid of the minimum wage. They'll they'll put uh, get rid of the minimum yeah, wage. Yeah, you know, well, yes. well, they'll lower yeah, the, I they'll, think that's the they'll, low, they'll lower the minimum wage. You know they're so selfish, and it goes on and on. We know what a NAT national government would do. They'll scrap everything. Scrap. They don't care about the individuals. They don't care about the about the communities. Hey, this boy, is about boy, us supporting the our the economy. The economy. <laughs> Inflation's coming back, the economy's looking good, we're on fire, this government's coming back. Amen. Uh, Damien Grant, your follow-up question to the Minister, please. <laughs> Every time Bomber talks about GST off fresh fruit and vegetables, it's always about his banana, and I'm just wondering whether there is, there is something else going on. Let's talk about free uh, this, this whole uh, dental thing, right? At the moment, how many, how many dentists do we train? Are we training a year? Well, we're not training enough, are we? But we'll get there. All right. Is it more? Is it it's going to take a couple of years. Don't get all smart with me, Damien. <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to get there. You've got to think into the future. You guys don't. You just think short term. This is one of the most brilliant policies we've ever rolled out. Even okay. David Seymour. This is... You guys, you guys don't care about these young people struggling in South and West Auckland. That's the problem, David. You just care about your rich mates, women, uh, Mr. Yeah, Goldfund, and Mr. Goldfund, Mr. Seymour's mates. Do you, know, do you know who my rich mates are? I'm not interested. They are dentists. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about dentists is that they are creaming it. Government turns around and says we are going to pour all of this money into where we'll look training. after the people and you won't. We are your yeah, dentists. Dentists are people too. We're training 60 dentists a year. We'll get the there. 60. We'll get there. We've got this all worked out. You heard Grant Robinson. <laughs> Shut up, Damien. There aren't enough dentists in the Philippines, Minister. Come on. Thank you. Thank you, really. David Seymour, Act wants to amputate the Ministry of Youth, the Ministry of Māori, the Ministry of Women, the Ministry of Pacific Peoples, Ministry of Ethnic Communities, and the Human Rights Commission. <laughs> Book burners. Um, you want to also slash billions in public spending. Is it your whole stick to mutilate the state so badly it can't work and citizens lose hope so your right wing stormtroopers can burn down every public service that doesn't sell guns? Your time starts now. Yeah, well, I think you actually got a little bit wrong there. Um, not as wrong as you got Goldies, but um, I think the point of our policy is we actually need public services to work better. Right now, they're not. 
Uh, you know, I have a bit of old lefty where you and me might connect. I think that a kid from a poor household should have a place they can go in their community where a knowledgeable adult will transfer them academic knowledge that gives them a shot at life, even if they, no matter how poor their background. And we're not doing that right now. I'm proud that when I had a little bit of political capital, practically none, I poured it into charter schools for disadvantaged kids. So we're actually interested in dumping wasteful spending, reducing the pressure on inflation that's putting up people's prices, because it means higher mortgage rates, it means higher rents, it means higher prices at the checkout and the pump, and making sure that when we spend money, we actually have clear objectives for the chief executive of that government department, say this is what you're trying to achieve for the people, and if you do it well, we might pay you a bit more. If you don't, then you're gone. So that's actually something you should get behind, Bomber, is higher quality services so that people who pay their taxes, people who hand over 18 billion bucks a year for education, can actually get kids showing up and learning something that's useful to them and the future of New Zealand. Damien Grant, your follow-up question to David. Why, David, I'm so disappointed, um, as well as not deregulating child labour laws, which is just, <laughs> so, so let me down, why, what is your reluctance to, get in, to put interest rates back on student loans? Because I think it's outrageous that Paul Goldsmith's children don't, can get interest-free student loans for their education isn't that an equitable policy? Because you're talking about the children of the, the, the middle class typically go to um, at university. Why not introduce interest on student loans? Um, well, first of all, I think if you look at the arguments around interest for, stu for student loans and young people, you know, this younger generation are getting hammered, but it's not actually interest on student loans that's the issue. That's not one of the biggest issues facing the government's books. The biggest issue for young people is being able to afford a place of their own in this country. You look at young people growing up who are trying to say, I want a piece of New Zealand that I can own. It's getting further and further away, and it means people do irrational things if they feel there's no place for them in a property owning democracy. Like they could vote Labor. green or they could move to Australia. We don't want either. So if you want so if you want it, so if you want to help young people, our view is very simple, make it easier to build a house. This country is practically uninhabited and we don't have enough habitat to do. Thank you, David. Uh, Ricardo, the Greens have gloriously championed a wealth tax and the socialist in me loves it, but you are basing most of your economic platform on getting $12 billion out of 0.7% of the population. What happens if that looks as wonky as National's foreign buyers tax cap? Not that anything could look as bad as your tax cap. Ricardo. I mean, I would love to get that feedback that National is getting regarding our tax plan being wonky. So far, actually, the main argument has been around um, the, the politics of whether uh, we would be able to get it through a coalition. And our message is really clear. If people want to see a wealth tax coupled with a tax-free threshold, the only way to get it across the line is by party voting green labor. And Hipkins don't get to rule out tax reform. It's actually voters who do. And I want to acknowledge um, the previous comments that were made around the cost of rent being one of the biggest uh, things that people are facing. This is why the Greens are taking rent controls um, as part of the political agenda. Same. Because it's not just about landlords being limited on how often they can put at rents. The issue is by how much they're putting it on. And rent controls will ensure that actually incomes are keeping up with wages. Sorry, with the cost of rent as well as inflation. Thank you. Uh, Damien, your follow-up question, please. The idea of, um, of, of rent controls, what's your, the, the standard response to that is that that is going to cause a reduction in, uh, in the rental properties coming onto the market. And there's already some anecdotal, ev anecdotal evidence that that is starting to happen. So how would you respond to the criticism that one of the effects of rent controls is twofold? One, if you've got, if you've got a, a rental property, you're reluctant to move, so you get stuck. And two, you actually result in less properties coming onto the market. And in fact, the third unintended consequence is that landlords tend to pick tenants that look like themselves. And so you have a perverse effect where the most marginalised in the community struggle to find a rental accommodation. How would you respond? If if landlords are discriminating tenants because they don't look like themselves, I'm sure they can. the tenants can take it to the Human Rights Commission if they're discriminating on the basis of ethnicity. Well, no, David's going to scrap them. But, but, but to your, but to your other point, <laughs> shut up, David. But honestly, the, the, main, the main critiques and examples overseas around rent controls 
ha are not, um, they cannot be applied to what we're trying to do because most of their in controls overseas have been to target it, not universal. And the other issue is, if the issue is property owners putting their properties in the market as opposed to renting it, actually what yeah. we do is increase the supply that is out there for first-home buyers. And the Greens are clear that it is not rent controls in isolation that will lower rent prices. It's by scaling up public housing mm. build that we're going to ensure that there's affordable housing for all. Thank you, Ricardo. John Tamahiri, the Māori Party. Round of applause for uh, John Tamahiri, the Māori Party are gloriously offering GST off all kai yep. while making everyone <coughs> earning under $30,000 a year tax-free. You will fund this by lifting the top tax rate to 48% over 300000 and create new full taxes, a net wealth tax, a foreign companies tax, a land banking tax, a vacant house tax. Tax any tax tax, tax tax. As a socialist, as a socialist I'm in heaven, please John marry me. How though can the Māori party make Damien's rich mates pay these new taxes without them all fleeing overseas? Your time starts now. Oh look, look firstly we've got to um, have a grown up conversation that if we continue to do what we're doing and, and merely twinking and tweeting and doing little things and tinkering, uh, we are not going to solve inequality in this country. And there's no doubt that the majority of the wealth in this country uh, was obtained uh, over a period of neoliberal economics where we had the privatisation of public assets. And most, fa and most families that have all the wealth uh, achieve that not by the sweat of their brow, uh, but by association with certain politicians. And right now in this election, they, they're, they're, they're buying the same politicians. So I, I just wanted to say, as part of that example, um, we will win our seats. I, look, look uh, the National Party candidate here is the only candidate I know running in an electorate seat who's defacing and pulling his own hoardings down. Now, now the problem, now the problem with problem with that is you wrought the democratic process. You're out of the only people JT, running for a top of vote here. Uh, 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 everybody but act the national. So wake up to the way in which it's rorted. Right. John, uh, thank you, John. Damien, your follow-up to John, please. Um, I don't quite know how to respond to uh, any of that. Um, so gonna... What was the question? Yeah. So I'm going to go in a, go in a completely different direction. Um, um, I was looking into smoking the other day. Um, oh, yes. Who here doesn't love a cigarette? Yeah. All right. Twenty percent of Maori people smoke, and under this government, the cost of smoking has rocketed up. And in um, eighteen months' time, the only cigarette you'll be able to buy will be little better than a placebo. This is an outrageous policy, particularly when consider the, the Pacquiao smoking rate is so much lower. Will you join me? in campaigning against this pernicious anti-smoking law that predominantly hurts the poor and those who are most committed to smoking? No. Uh, good <laughs> answer. No, no, and the reason, and the reason is, is because of the knock-on <laughs> knock cost. Well, I'm uh, no, there's knock-on costs in terms of significant health costs at the end life situation. So it's not the first smoke that people take, it's the consistency of it, and you're not looking too healthy. Kia ora. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you, thank you, John. Jenny. New Zealand First was born out of a political reflex against neoliberalism and the extremes of free market euthanasia. Yet these days, Winston is raging against bilingual signs and wants toilet police to check people's gender in public bathrooms. Is New Zealand focused on the cost of living crisis or a list of culture war grievances your rabbit hole uncle keeps repeating on reality? <laughs> Your time starts now. I think I'll push back on that. I think we, fee we see a, a, a particular headline grabber that we, our media grabs onto. We have uh, some great ideas in terms of how do we tackle the cost of living, the crisis that we're facing, our supermarket duopolies, which are just gouging out and forcing Kiwi, Kiwi families to starve. Families cannot put food on their tables. 23% increase on the cost of fruit and vegetables. 11% increase on the cost of meat and vegetables. We will remove GST from fresh fruit and vegetables as well as meat and poultry. So that is one way we will tackle the cost of living crisis. We will deal to the duopoly of the supermarkets. We need to benchmark the prices in New Zealand. Have a look at what they're doing in Australia and see where they are gouging us. $430 million excess profit that the supermarkets are making a year. They need to be taken, taken down. 
I mean system. Uh, Damien. $450 million excess profit. What's that about? That's about one seventh of the provincial growth fund. So, <laughs> I mean, we could just do a bit of redistribution, uh, couldn't we? Um, uh, let's talk about the, um, the supermarkets. You said that you would, you would deal to them. One of the reasons why we have a supermarket duopoly in this country is that it is so difficult for new supermarkets coming in to actually acquire land. What is New Zealand first going to do in respect to making it easy for overseas supermarkets to come into this country? Because at the moment, my understanding is New Zealand first is very hostile to, to, um, to overseas investment. We're not hostile to overseas investment, we are hostile to oh, yeah. things oh. like oh. In, international uh, people coming to New Zealand and buying up our houses like the National Party would, would have them do to boost up the economy. Where that didn't happen, that didn't work previously, it won't work again. Absolutely we're, we're against that. We're also, uh, we're also very mindful that during this cost of living crisis, if we only just deal to the supermarkets, we're not also going to deal, we need to also deal to the banks because they are rorting us as well. Oh, yes. So we must take on these Australian banks who've had uh, multiple no. studies in their take country, but and they, they are rorting us more than they're rorting their own people. We need to Comrades, we must move on to issue two of the crime crisis. The sudden shocking spike in youth crime has frightened many Kiwis and they don't feel safe in their own homes. Alongside this youth crime wave, we have an organised crime turf war as 501 syndicates stand over domestic gangs for the billion dollar meth trade. Willie Jackson, the 501s flooded into uh, flooding New Zealand are using sophisticated criminal tactics, uber violence and South American cartel links bringing in purer and cheaper meth. This level of organised crime demands a serious response that can differentiate the difference between the mongrel mob and the common chiros. What is Labour doing to ensure cartels don't fuel our gang wars? Well, you've, already, oh, man, you've already seen the wonderful work from Jacinda Ardern. Uh, <laughs> With regards to negotiating, uh, with regards to Australian uh, rights, you're not going to see these gangsters come over anymore. I don't know what everybody's yelling at. It's an absolute fact. She's she's negotiated there with Albo. The wonderful Chippy has followed up on it, and, and now you're not going to see that flow on that we had before in terms of the 501. So that uh, area has been uh, has been checked. In terms of crime, we take crime very seriously. You've seen the uh, you've seen the investment in terms of police. We've put more investment in the police than national did in, their, in their nine years. We've had a huge investment in terms of police. Uh, we've seen ram raids go through the roof, but we are working with our with our shop owners. 35, 35 million given to shop owners. I mean, you know, it's. Uh, it's been uh, really good, the, the, the investment uh, and support around these people. It's not an easy uh, area to fix. We've got kids now that sadly we had to change the law and it's been a, it's been a tough area for myself with 12 and 13 year olds now eligible to go, go to court and go to jail. You, you put that against the Act policy who want to bring back in, uh, what is it, assault weapons and assault rifles and, and, and keep the gun register and we've got a very, very dangerous country. Because of David Seymour Damien. and his act mates. Damien, your question for Willie Bell. I just, I just think it's, it's it's important to note that this is, I think, the first time the Labour Party has ever met some Jacinda Ardern. Yes. <laughs> I was wondering what happened to her. I mean, I saw Helen Clark popped up, but um, and just to be clear, ram raids don't go through the roof; they go through the, the, the front door. But, Are you ever going to um, ask a bloody question? Or? <laughs> Uh, I kind of like the attention. Um, uh, you, you, you made reference, and, and, and you're right, uh, Minister Jackson, you're right when you're talking about the wraparound services. But hasn't an opportunity been lost? Because that was one of the things that Bill English was really hot on, and it seemed to me that that policy was abandoned in the, uh, in, um, when Jacinda became Prime Minister. Has an opportunity been lost there? No, it hasn't, and Bill did some good work in there, and myself and John have both worked, believe it or not, with National in the past, 
in terms of those wraparound services, really important. We're still doing those wraparound uh, services. Kotahi Whakaro is uh, one of the strategies that we run. We find out when the kids get into those wraparound services, there's an 80, 82% success rate. So they're still happening, uh, but some of, the, some of the public don't want to see it. They just want to throw these kids in jail and throw the key away. Well, That's I mean, not how we're going to operate as a government. That's not how a humanitarian government should operate, quite separate to a national and act government. Thank well, I mean, you, Jay, 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 Jay. David Seymour, has ACT been whipping this law and order debate up? You described a Apodiki as Mogadishu, gang behaviour as subhuman, and you want to repeal the arms registry and allow the favourite right. submachine gun of sociopaths back on the street. That's true. When has more guns been the solution to anything, David? Right. Where to start? Well, first of all, I noticed La uh, Willie said that Labour take crime seriously. You know what the problem is? Criminals don't take Labour seriously. That's why. <laughs> That, that, that's why we're in the that's why we're in the situation that we're in. This massive experiment of letting criminals out of jail and pretending if we're kind to them they'll be kind back, it's failed. And it has failed at great cost and often tragic cost to the people that I'm hearing from every day. And it's not that we've whipped it up, it's that as the local MP in Epsom, I'm actually sick of going and visiting people that have been another victim, another victim, another victim. Now, if it's hard for me to do it, imagine what it's like for those people losing their livelihoods, their insurance goes up. I had one shopkeeper, I went into a shop who had an arm in a sling, I said, what went wrong? She said, I was trying to fight a robber. That shouldn't be happening in the middle of Auckland, but it is. And it's a direct result of the attitude Labour's taken. But if you can diagnose the problem, then the solution is to run as hard as you can in the opposite direction. And that's why X Alternative Budget says that we will increase funding for prison spaces, we'll change the Sentencing Act, we'll ensure that there are consequences for criminals and rights for those who are just trying to get by and make an honest buck. Damien, your question for David, please. Let's talk about cigarettes. <laughs> Are you getting sponsored? Hey, yes. <laughs> An allegation was I, I get paid by Big Tobacco. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm hoping to get paid by Big Tobacco. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why these ram raids are occurring is because cigarettes are becoming such a valuable commodity. And as I mentioned to John Tamahiri before, that cigarettes are soon going to be an effectively prohibition, um, um, going to be banned in around um, 18 months. What is Act's policy in respect of the, um, uh, the current policy to restrict the number of sites that can sell cigarettes to only 600 by the middle of next year and then reduce cigarettes to almost nothing more than placebo. Look, I think we've got to be a bit honest here. Smoking's bad for you and ideally you shouldn't do it, but what the government's doing is worse. They put so much tax on it's vastly more <coughs> than the costs of smokers on the healthcare system. They're already paying for their healthcare through tobacco tax and they claim less super. Hey, thanks guys. And they claim less super, so I reckon smokers fiscally are doing everyone a favour. On the other hand, you know, you've got these restrictions on small business owners trying to make an honest buck, making them tax collectors for tobacco tax, meaning they're getting beaten up and attacked by these ram raids, and that is shocking. It's a terrible public health outcome. But I have to say that the tobacco issue is far from the only reason we've got crime in New Zealand because it's much more widespread than that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. Ricardo, Labour wants to put ankle bracelets on 12-year-olds. ACT wants to put them on 11-year-olds, while National wants to put them on 10-year-olds. Is the fact that we're having a race as to how young we can put ankle bracelets on children an indicator sure we aren't true. even pretending oh, to have on, an adult debate on crime and punishment and selection? Your thoughts? Yeah, I think any politician that tries to tell us that um, we can talk about crime and quips and one-liners is not following the evidence. Right. And um, as somebody who worked with formerly incarcerated people uh, prior to being an MP, I saw firsthand how the system was failing them and, and led them to be to reoffend. One of the things, for example, that we can do to improve support for formerly incarcerated people is improving the Freedom to Steps grant and the support that we provide um, via agencies. I've seen people come out of jail who are 
supposed to be held by corrections, they're not held by corrections, then pass on to MSD, not held by MSD. You leave them without income, they have no support, and what option is left there but to reoffend? So I think by increasing the support and making it meaningful that is provided to formerly incarcerated people, we prevent reoffending. That is actually what the evidence tells us. Locking people up for indeterminate amounts of time hasn't worked in the US. Harsher penalties have no evidence of working. Anyone who's lived in big cities in the US know that crime is also rampant despite them having bigger prisons, greater penalties, and so therefore we need to follow the evidence. I mean you did in prison. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes Ricardo locking people up uh, can work. Um, but let's, let's, one, of the, one of the reasons why we have the problem with crime is drug prohibition. Where do you or the Greens sit with respect to not just marijuana, but some of the other products like methamphetamine? And if I could just, the guys at the back, we, we, we can hear you. If you could just, just mind to, to lower it down, because I want to hear what Ricardo has to say. So where, where are you at with decriminalisation for, for things like synthetic cannabis and, and other products? Taking a public health approach is what works. And I think in the debate with cannabis, that was really evident um, in relationship to having a, con a political conversation that wasn't led by evidence. And this is why when we look at things like decriminalising or legalising cannabis, we have to even centre those regimes with a public health uh, framework. Um, Having grown up in Eastern California, I've seen what happens when we legalize it but end up actually taking a much more corporatized approach to the model that we take. And so I think with any drug, we have to follow best evidence when it comes to public health that includes tobacco, cannabis, um, methamphetamines, and other drugs. Thank you, Ricardo. John, Māori are grotesquely overrepresented in the crime and punishment stats, and any attempt to mitigate that is seen as cuddling crims rather than punishing them. All that is being offered up by the right is more prisons and more prisoners. How do you talk to an electorate who just want punishment? Your time starts now. Oh, you, you can't. <clears throat> and um, see, one of the problems we've got is that uh, this whip up that's going on at the moment. When you look at where crime occurs, and particularly violent crime and ram raids, it occurs in poor communities. <coughs> if our poor kids from West Auckland, South Auckland, visited Kohimaramara, Rimueta more frequently, we'd be, be uh, probably happier. But the problem is, they don't. So what you've got to do is understand what drives their behaviours. Now, um, like anything, if you're going to sell anything that uh, people want to seek, like banks have money. So they have to fund their only defence mechanisms for their business. What I've said to our dairy owners out west is, stop selling cigarettes and vapes. Right? Oh, we can't do that. That's our high, that's our high margin uh, um, product. Uh, because you, what you've got to do is you've got to play the game too. It's not all one way traffic. The second, thing, the second point I'd make, which is the most important point, there is 4,500 young Māori, not, uh, 14 to 24, not on employment, education, training or skills, in the West. There are 20,000 in South Auckland. They've got nowhere to go but the gangs. Now, everyone in, in, from every one of these politicians here have been in government knowing that and did nothing about it. We have to sit and pick up the pieces because all the resources go to fund people to manage Māori failure rather than fix it. And Damien, that's our problem in this whole society. Your follow-up question, please, Damien. So John, you, 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 you spoke about what drives the behaviour. What does drive the behaviour? What is it that leads to those young people, regardless of their ethnic background, what is it that leads them to that situation where the gangs is the best alternative option? That, that can't be happening in a vacuum. Well, it doesn't. And uh, if you have a look at, say, oh, just the 14 secondary schools in West Auckland, one third of people that can afford to drive away from them do so. So we've got, a, we've got a major problem, uh, elephant in the room, where we have failure across multiple sectors in New Zealand society where they should be doing a far better job for the kids. Now, we, a lot of our parents send kids to school in the hope that they're going to be educated. They were not, and the generation before them were not. So if, if you, you cannot police and prison your way out of poverty, you know? We get sick and tired of blunt, crude instruments being used to manage our populations when better interventions would work a lot better and be far cheaper. Thank you, John.
Jenny. Your leader, Winston Peters, has called for a misuse of the Terrorism Suppression Act to designate all gangs as domestic terrorists so that paramilitary police can suspend their civil liberties and shoot them. Is gerrymandering the terrorism suppression law so that the state can go full-blown romper-stomper on its own citizens really the solution to crime? You don't, you don't have to accept the premise of the question. Yeah, they then hasn't ever. I think you're reading from your own novel you've just written. Um, I think what you're actually have misrepresented there is that there is a need to ensure that uh, gangs are aware that there will be harsh and firm penalties. And, and if we want to do similar to what the Labour uh, policy is, which is more like a fishing policy, which is catch and release, then we're not going to have any change in our society. We're not going to have people feeling safe in our society if we just have that soft kind of approach. So yes, we meet, need to make sure that there are strong and firm consequences, but at the same time, let's give them an option, which is what um, Winston has talked about as well, is you know, there's ch a choice of prison, or let's get you into full-time work. Okay. Uh, David, your follow-up question, please. How would you define a gang? Well, usually they're, they're patched. Uh, so, um, I mean, you know, we've got some patches up here. Is David Seymour in a gang? Yeah, he is, actually. <laughs> Taxpayers' unions, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's there, a serious there is, question. There is also, too, I think we need to look at, and JT raised an interesting point here about our young people. New Zealand First, um, we've had a very successful programme when we were in government with, with Labour. Um, it was, it's the Limited Services Volunteers Program, which, which yeah, is yeah. in conjunction with the Defence Force. And it gave these young people an opportunity to learn some skills, to look at their behaviour, okay, to, to have some good guidance. Was, um, and that was. that was a program that we were able to double the numbers and get some really positive, um, positive outcomes for these young people. Okay, so I think, I think the issue there, Jenny, and, I, and, it's a, and it's an issue that I think runs all across the political spectrum, is defining a gang is actually quite difficult. And, I, and the risk you face, and the risk that the new government may face, is you are creating a large degree of subjectivity and handing it over to the state, which might prove to be a bad thing. Uh, thank you, uh, Damien. Uh, Paul, national so-called plan is to ban gang patches in public, a policy that would be utterly impossible to enforce and requires a state that polices people's clothing choices. Isn't banning gang patches the most stupid, pointless, tedious, won't ever work in a fucking million years policy? And if not, please tell New Zealand how you're going to arrest all 8,900 patched gang members and where will you fit them into New Zealand's prison system that can only take an extra 1,000? Thank you very much. Uh, look, I mean, that, that managed in Western Australia and what we did was we banned it in, in schools and public hospitals and it's made a real difference. There's less intimidation going on. But f fundamentally what we've had is this, uh, Willie and his mates uh, came in. There's only one priority in the justice sector that's clearly articulated, which is to reduce the prison population, irrespective of what's going on in our community. And at the same time as they've reduced the prison population by more than 20%, there's been a 33% increase in violent crime and 100% in retail crime. And so what we've got to do is we've got to change the direction and focus on the overall focus of justice policy should be to reduce the numbers of victims of crime. That's what we're focused on. Uh, and that's why we're going to uh, uh, toughen up the sentences. We're actually going to restrict the ability of judges to massively reduce sentences so that people who are convicted of serious crimes don't end up on home detention uh, and out and about creating new crimes. So uh, that's what we've got to do there, and we've got to deal firmly with the gangs. Uh, uh, and if anybody's tempted to vote for the Greens, just remember that it's Ricardo's policy that if you've got a warrant out for your arrest and you're on the run, you should still get your benefit because it's very expensive. Today. It's There's very expensive when you're on the run. Tickets. And that and sums up everything it. you need to know about the Greens. You so you actually have no way of arresting a thousand five hundred people. That's literal misinformation. That's true. That's true. It's, it's, like, it's, 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 I've heard it's your parking ticket in the fine, house on that fine. Fine. And you know this. Okay, all right. know this. So, um, um, so just to be clear, the Greens Party's policy is if you're on the run, can you claim the benefits? Yes. Yes, he's so campaigning. Warrant, so, no, no, no. It's yes or no. So Louise Upston 
his colleague tried to find out, out of the time that we've had this benefit sanction, how many people have been a threat to public safety. And over the 10 plus the years, policy. only two people have been a threat to public safety. Most of them are, are have okay. a warrant to arrest for things like unpaid parking fines. Do we want to... Okay, do all right, all right. So... Go, so, go and find it out. Go and ask the minister. Okay, no, no, no. So, so all right. Let's, let's, let's just talk about gangs. One of, one of uh, National's policy is to delegate to the, to the police the ability to, to issue non-solicitation uh, orders. Isn't there a risk that we are delegating to the police power that really should sit with the judiciary? How do you... How do you balance that? Because from a civil libertarian perspective, that seems concerning. Yeah, well, we've got a real challenge with gangs. We've had a 66% increase in gang membership over the last six years. They're recruiting faster than the police. Uh, and we've got a real situation with the Aussies coming over, the 501. So we've got to actually have a firm response. It's stopping. Uh, and, well, maybe it is. I don't know. You must have missed the negotiation. And so the mixed messages that we've had you from Labour, uh, which is to say that we're, we're kind of tough it's on gangs over. sometimes, but on the other times we fund them for um, Harry Tam and all Elba, that. Elba, Elba's not means means that it's not an effective response to gangs. So we've got to give the police the tools they need uh, to harass the gangs on a regular basis to try and keep them... Harass? Uh, yes, harass. absolutely to harass the gangs. Okay. They're the ones who are causing, causing misery in our communities. Okay. Comrades, we must move on to issue three, co-governance, the treaty and extremism. This election, we have seen an ugly debate erupt over co-governance and the treaty that has led to an extremism we rarely see in New Zealand politics outside in a ro outside and an Ori was speech by Don Brash in Halloween costume. David Seymour, you have made a referendum to redefine the treaty a bottom line with National. Why on earth would Māori Dim accept you, of all people, to redefine the treaty and then just force it upon them? ACT is going to start a race war if you try to force a redefined treaty onto Māori that will make the seabed and foreshore issue look mild in comparison. Won't it? No, and actually what I've said is that we believe in universal human rights, the idea that each human being is alike in dignity, the way the treaty has been interpreted by the tribunal and the courts over the last 50 years is incompatible, not only with the treaty itself and the events surrounding its signing, but incompatible with the values of liberal democracy and one person, one vote that have made society succeed. We all want to do three things, to cherish the Maori language and culture, to put right the wrongs of the past and ensure that two kids born side by side in different <coughs> beds in the same hospital have the same choices and chances in life. But the ACT Party says we are more likely to achieve that in a liberal democratic state where each person is entitled to one five millionth of the opportunity this country has to offer. No more, no less, and certainly not because of who your ancestors were. That's how we achieve those goals of putting wrong the rights of the past, being a diverse and inclusive society, and giving everyone an equal choice and chance. Unfortunately, the way this government behaves is dividing New Zealand, it is discriminating against people based on race, there's no future in it, and we need to have an honest and open conversation to put it right. Yes. Yes. Damien, your follow-up question, please. Uh, <coughs> David, I, I, I agree with everything you've just said. The one area surprise, where... Surprise, surprise. The one... Surprise. <laughs> just, just wait. <laughs> Total surprise. You're not, you're like, not an ex You don't like right? what I have to say next. The one area where I disagree is that... Because I think the principles are completely made up in 1975 and I don't think they exist in the treaty. Oh. But there are a lot of people who do. Yeah. And where you have a situation where there is at least the perception that there are principles of the treaty, there are two sides to this, the iwi and the crown, if you hold a referendum, isn't that equivalent to one side of the treaty saying, we're going to redefine the terms? How do you reconcile that? Don't you need a different path to unwind the principles? No, because there's not one side of the treaty. There are people who are part of this country, whether they legally immigrated here or whether they're born here. And I think they have the right to have a say on the constitutional future of their country. You know, on the 14th of October, Australia will go to the polls in a referendum on the voice. The problem we have in New Zealand is that people have not been asked for 50 years. And when they talk about it, 
They're told that they're racist with no logic whatsoever. They're shouted down. They're cancelled, and they're told that they're not even allowed to have an opinion. I'm told I'm not allowed to have an opinion because of my identity and my background. I want an honest discussion based on facts and logic, not constant personal attacks. Thank you, thank you, David. Thank you, David. Ricardo, evangelical preacher Julian Batchelor's anti-code governance tour has been a cavalcade of racism that would embarrass the Ku Klux Klan. The level of hatred that has been whipped up against any attempt to work with Māori has taken a life of its own. Why so much hate? Yeah, and I think the hosts of this debate now want to reflect on their own contributions to whipping up some of this anti-Māori sentiment. Um, I think the reality is, is that we have a deeply unequal society that has, has meant some groups have become disenfranchised, Māori and non-Māori aside. But one of, the beauty, one of the things that is beautiful about the, tr the treaty is that it does mean the Crown has obligations to look after its own people as well. And this is why when we think about policies like free dental care for all, are, those are tiriti policies. Those are policies that are there to actually honour the promise the Crown made when signing the treaty. And I think it will do, go some way towards social cohesion and actually mitigating some of that hate. Damien, your follow-up question, please. <clears throat> Tap sugar. How? I'm sorry, I'm just saying that. Uh, how is free dental care, which is universal, mm -hmm. I'm not saying whether it's a good or bad policy, but, but, but how is that consistent with the treaty? Where I don't see the connection between if the crown, those two. If the Crown has an obligation to look the after 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 its people, then having better public access to public health services goes some way towards the crowds taking responsibility for their side of the bargain, which they haven't. And that was part of where the tensions initially started, where the where actually British subjects where we're not being looked after by the Crown, and that's but isn't, where... But isn't the response to that would be self-determination would mean that um, uh, iwi should look after their own people? Why, why is the and Crown intervening there? And that's why we want to resource Takafai Ora and do far more to ensure that resources are devolved to Māori. Those two things are not incompatible. Thank you, Ricardo. John, Three Waters, Co-Governance and Bilingual Signs. Critics will cry, this is marification of New Zealand culture that erodes our one person, one vote democratic tradition, despite numerous legal cases and laws stating Māori do have specific indigenous rights. Why are Pākehā so angry and frightened by Māori right now? Oh, because of uh, politicians like David. And um, oh, right. the, problem, and the, problem, right. the problem with his narrative, yeah. the problem with his narrative, it's not based on the rule of law. That's right. And if the tyranny it's of the majority the wants, no, to take out, wants to take over the rights of a minority, right. that minority has a right to start to defend itself and stand up for itself. Right. This nation was settled by consent, not by discovery, not by conquest, but by consent. Parka people are here by consent, and that's great. But they promised when they arrived that we'd be treated equally. That's Article 3. They promised when they arrived that Article 2, we'd have rights over our own domains. Yeah. Simple yeah. as that. We agree with that. No, it's a very simple No, no you want to take away those rights. We are still no, waiting right. yeah. for it to be adhered to. Sure. It's as simple as that. Now, when we say, Chaka Whaiora, we want our own Māori Health Authority, yeah. we die seven years in advance of white folk, that seems to be okay. Well, it's not. Okay. No because the dollars, okay. the dollars are deployed in a way in which we don't get access to health. I'll give, I'll give you one example. Uh, the capitation fund, where I'm worth $400, my, all my kids are. Uh, so the what fund? Capitation Cap fund. For GPs. When, when you go to a GP, right, gotcha. then, then you pay a top up. The fact of the matter is, Māori don't get access to it, because 60,000 Māori didn't go to a GP because they couldn't afford all the add-ons uh, in the primary health care service in 2020. Now, that's not a fair health system. And it also costs a hell of a lot more to fix them when they are crook. Was it, was it only Maori people who couldn't afford to go to a GP? Doesn't, doesn't David have a point that the principles of the no, treaty no. really kicked in in the 1975 no. Treaty of no. Waitangi Act? There wasn't an awful lot of commentary around that. And isn't that part of the problem that we've got these treaty, these, these treaty principles 
that are quite hard to define. Oh my and so we're getting into a situation where a long way from, from 1840 now, we are trying to interpret what people meant back then. Aren't we getting ourselves into it? And we're tying ourselves into a whole pile of knots when the issue should be issues based on need, not yes. race. Yeah. Yes. No, no, um, yes. no, no, it should be, it should be based on need, but um, the problem is, it's based on race the way it's handed out at the moment. So all we want, all we want is, our side, fair, is our fair share of our per capita entitlements and no stop and just stop park your people spending it on our behalf, failing us and then calling us failures. And the final thing I'll say about your um, prelude to your, your initial question is that there is no doubt that Māori contested uh, the treaty all the way up to 75 and beyond. There's petitions. Look, it's legend throughout our whole history of parliamentary democracy that at no time did we leave a stone unturned. We have been on this march, and here's the other thing, we're never going to stop. Thank you. Thank you, John. Jenny, New Zealand First, New Zealand First has deep links with the anti-vax movement, and one of your candidates thinks there are nano robots in the vaccine, while Winston is singing his usual "Ewe elites are stealing from his karaoke greatest hits." Are New Zealand First adding to the extremism, or are you actually trying to have a dialogue? Your time starts now. Oh, look, I'd just like to, to go back to the treaty because um, I would like to, uh, to New, New Zealand first acknowledges the treaty as our founding document. So I, want, I really want to put that out there. And I think um, if you look at back at, at a, a lot of the work that Winston and New Zealand first have done, through the time in Parliament, we have put a lot of money into supporting Māori. So I just want to make sure that you understand we are not anti-Māori. We believe no, I'm that... anti -vags. We believe that uh, we need to uplift uh, Māori in particular where there is need um, and, and without, without the, the racial overlay on top of that. So, um, Thank you. Uh, Damien, you've got a follow-up question? Was the mandate wrong? Uh, I, yes, according to um, our policy, we believe that the mandates uh, should not have been there um, and that should be removed no, immediately. If, 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 only, <laughs> if only New Zealand First had somebody in a position of power at the time that they were... Yeah, I think initially... What a, what a initially, missed opportunity! What do you think? Initially, we, we didn't know what was coming down the pipeline. It was, it yeah, was that's brand why we new. Had the it wasn't until, that's why we had the you know, mandates. And then, and then, and then was, when the science became evident, the um, that was the time. But by yeah, then, 2020, the, no, 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 the, no, Jenny, the country I, voted I'm for for the Labour Party. The, the podium of truth was there for all to see. <laughs> so how did your leader miss what was happening? What was he doing at the time the mandate? Well, at, at, at the, Supporting the, Labour. The, at the beginning of... Uh, COVID, when it came to, to New Zealand shores, Winston was sent back up north. So he, he wasn't was at the podium. He didn't have much truth. choice on that, was he? Okay. No. Thank, okay. You. Right? Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Paul Goldsmith. Paul Goldsmith. Picture this. A hard-working European New Zealander works a whole day at their back-breaking job and they slump down on their couch to watch the news and the weather is using a mouldy word they don't know! Cue existential race war panic stations. By whipping up the nonsense National did over bilingual science, are you feeding a garden variety bigotry, or are you bravely challenging it? Uh, well, look, look, I mean, I think the, the, the broader issue is around um, where do we go forward as a country? Now, Willie's uh, government uh, have actually done some pretty radical things in this area, particularly at the local government level. And particularly the Rotorua bill, where they moved away from equal voting rights. And uh, we took, and so, we took it away. And, and, well, and they tried, and no, then they, no. they gave up. And then they brought in the Canterbury bill, which moves explicitly away from equal voting rights and also gives Naitahu the ability to appoint councillors. Uh, and so, so, so we basically have a, simple, simple, have a simple, simple view that all New Zealanders should have equal voting rights. They've moved away from it. Never, at no point, did Jacinda Ardern or Kerry Allen 
or Willie Jackson or any of those people stand up and actually explain why one group of New Zealanders should have different voting rights to other groups of New Zealanders. And we think so that, that's quite an important issue that we feel very strongly about, and that's why we think we should all have equal voting rights in our country. Did you make the ECAN equal um, uh, voting rights when you took that over? Well, what happened was a, a democratically accountable government made appointments, uh, short-term appointments to ECAN, e and then if the public didn't like it, they could throw them out. And, uh, they could right? throw them out at the next election, but you can never throw an, a, a permanent appointment out from a particular tribe, and so we don't agree with that. Damien, your follow-up question. How would you handle a situation where, because um, uh, John here is of the view that Māori own the water, I may yeah. th that be fair? Well, uh, we haven't legally argued any. No, but, no, I'm, no that, but that's your position. No, no, it's the legal position. Okay, yeah. all right. So, but uh, um, a lot, a, a lot of people believe that, right? I mean, I'm not one of them, but, but isn't, isn't, well, well, hang on. isn't Let's do it another way? Prove that you own it. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not arguing the point. My no, question. No, I, well, my question. You can't my have question, it both ways. My it, it comes out of the sky. My it comes out of the sky. My, my, well, my, you've taken no, 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 my question. My question is. My question to you is. There is water and a number of other things where Māori yeah. under the treaty may well have legal rights. So isn't in some ways co-governance an attempt to square that circle? Well, we, we use it in the, in the context of uh, some treaty settlements. And what this government has done is turbocharged it into uh, major decisions around public services. Fun and license. We don't agree with yeah, well, that. No, and, and so read his book. So the basic proposition with the three... You must have read the wrong chapter. The three, basic read proposition the with the three waters thing is to give 50-50 decision-making. We don't think that the, the treaty requires 50-50 decision making between two sets of people because we're all New Zealanders and we should have an equal yeah, say. But, but, isn't, but, isn't, isn't, but isn't Minister Jackson correct that it was under the last government, Chris Finlayson, who did some fantastic work, but didn't he open the door to this issue? Yeah, and now that it's opened, how do you close it? Of course you do. Well, well uh, I mean, there's a difference between uh, uh, a co-governance arrangements for the volcanic cones in Auckland in the context of a treaty settlement and saying that you should have two separate health systems with 50-50 decision making. And when it comes to the water, how, how that's controlled in the sewage in your city, it's 50-50 decision making based on ethnicities. Thank different you. Thing. Thank you, Paul. Willie Jackson, co-governance was a structure created by Act and National to build a management process to manage shared assets. How the Christ did an attempt to give indigenous people a voice in their own country become manufactured into an existential race crisis where Western democracy itself was suddenly at risk? Your time's us now. Uh, David Seymour's fault again. There's absolutely no doubt about it. You know, the saddest thing I've been hearing was him again talking about how he knows more than all the judges of the last 50 years. I just can't get over it, David, how you think you know more than Lord Cook in 1987, who was the most learned judge in the history of New Zealand uh, judges, how you know more than Sean Elias. I can't get over how you know more than Bill English, you know more than John Key, you know more than Jim Bolger, you know more than Doug Graham. You, you're without doubt the Donald Trump of New Zealand politics. Because Trump, 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 Trump no, no, but he's a, no, here's the thing, Bomber. Trump did the same thing. The judges don't know anything. Every court, every appeal court, every Supreme Court, the Privy Council have all said how Māori have indigenous and treaty rights. They've all said it. John Key, one of his heroes in 2010, stood up and talked about indigenous rights. I do not get the same, well I do get the Seymour strategy because it's about gathering votes. But you put, you know, th this judicial system's in place, Māori believe in it. But oh no, if there's, a, if there's a, a ruling going our way, old Seymour and his mates all want to get rid of all well, the judges, to, to all the prime ministers, all the governments who've supported partnership. It's a total disgrace. To be fair though, Willie, Nelson Mandela would also vote for him. So. Oh, oh, that's true. Well, funny thing, the funny thing is I met Nelson Mandela. What did he say? Well, I reckon he'd say lock. David Seymour up. Thank you. <laughs> David Grant, your time. Your question, um, please. I just want to point out this is not a roast David Seymour. Um, Why not? Oh, <laughs> because he probably enjoys the attention. No, no. Um, I think he does, actually. <laughs> um, okay, all right. Let's, now, let's, let's uh, talk about that, um, about 
the, the courts. Because one of the issues, particularly, I noticed that there is an issue there is concern about judicial activism, talking about the Supreme Court with Tikanga, uh, and there, there does appear to be a bit of an issue where our judges are getting ahead of oh, where right. Parliament is. Oh, yeah. So, an answer to your Terrible question... Terrible putting a Māori sort in, of concept in, up, in one, um, one in, in response to your question, you know, why is David Seymour right, might be parliamentary sovereignty. So my question is, how would you reconcile the issue where you've got what appears to be judicial activism on one hand, potentially with parliamentary sovereignty clashing on the Damien, other? Damien, you're talking a load of rubbish. All right, you're talking about later. Yes, you have had every prime minister who this guy supported. Key, Key stood up in Parliament. He made a declaration in terms of Maori Indigenous rights. We're not asking for new rights it, it here. Doesn't, doesn't it, Trump voting? Uh, rights. We're, we're, he, we're not trying to get a, a new setup here. We're just trying to get what's already been rolled out supported. This guy's running away from it because he so wants to be in the next government. So whatever David says. He won't challenge. Hey, look, Go, I, Goldie, I Goldie doesn't even know whether he's a Māori or a Pākehā. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he don't know, know where he's from. So these, these guys are lost. They don't know where they're going. And this bloke, he's on a roll because he's watched Trump in America and he's going down the same track. Okay. He's going uh, down the same track. Trump right. knows best. Think... Trump knows best. And it's a gong race Trump Strategy. I think, right. they must I think we need to give David. We need to no, give no, David. No, no, no. Well, well, I, I, he shouldn't we be bringing my great great ever hug after. We shouldn't be bringing my great great grandfather into this. What are you talking about? We must move on to issue four in the climate crisis. Catastrophic climate change caused by human pollution is interrupting the agricultural calendar around the world and exacerbating global poverty while generating huge costs in domestic economies. We face nothing less than an existential crisis for our species. In 1980, the time between billion dollar climate destruction events was three months. It's now 18 days. Whether you believe in climate change or not, there is a point where the next destructive weather event strikes before you can rebuild from the last one. Ricardo, more than 75% of indigenous species and reptile, bird, bat and freshwater fish species groups are threatened with extinction. Estimates of nitrogen applied to land and fertiliser increase from 62,000 tonnes to 452,000 tonnes. Of the 295 lakes surveyed, 35.6% are in poor ecological condition. Dairy cattle numbers increased by 82% nationally from 3.4 million to 6.3 million. James Shaw has been climate minister for six years. Looking at those appalling numbers, why does he deserve another three years? Well, the Greens have had to work with the government we were handed, and right now we've had a Labour majority government that unfortunately is not going as far as we would want, and the science tells us that we need to go on climate change. And, and where most of the ministerial positions that can make the most impact lie actually outside of the climate change portfolio. This is why the Greens are fighting to ensure that we can have a greater influence in cabinet and in policy next term. One of the examples that we're fighting for this election when it comes to emissions reduction, waste reduction, but actually also just about sensible decision making, is around, rather than doing underground light rail in Auckland, doing surface light rail, which will create less emissions, create less construction waste, It'll be quicker and it'll support people have more options of transport, where it, which is where most of our emissions are coming. So the Greens have the power of balance after the election. These are the kind of things that we'll be fighting for to reduce emissions, but actually to support people get around in the cities. Amen. Thank you. Damien, your follow-up question, please. How would you respond to the criticism that New Zealand's global emissions count for, for very little? The one thing that we can do is we can make ourselves relatively poor. When we had the floods here in Auckland in February, our infrastructure held up reasonably well. We're a first world city. Well, if, if, if those floods had happened in a poorer city, the results would have been a lot worse. So if we reduce our carbon emissions, aren't we, aren't we, aren't we, doing, aren't we doing so at the risk of making ourselves poorer without actually doing anything to reduce global emissions? I think. Going the way we are going is making us poor. Building on flop planks and building against nature rather than with nature is making families poor. And if every jurisdiction around the world was, and you know, you could you could separate jurisdictions or, or entities into cities. If, if Los Angeles said, we don't want to do a part because the rest of the US makes more emissions, then no one would be doing anything. We all have to do a part. But I would dispute the point that climate action drive makes us poor. 
the way that we're building our cities, which is not in a climate friendly way, is making families poorer. We need to plan our cities better in a way that it is climate conscious and that will actually support people's finances and futures as well. Thank you, Ricardo. John Tomahiri, a cow creates the same fecal load as 14 humans. We have 10 million cows. That's the equivalent of 140 million humans pissing and shitting into our lakes and really? rivers each year. Do we have too many cows? What will the Māori Party do about that? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And, uh, yeah, and that's why you're here. Anyway, so so the, the, the issue that we've got there is that we've got too many. But there's a, a transition program that needs to occur. Yeah. And so you, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so the transition program and setting clear uh, lines and dates, uh, key performance indicators for all industries is going to be required. And so governments have to have uh, the backbone to set those markets. Now, this one uh, ha has pushed them out. And uh, if uh, another government gets elected, uh, it'll be their rich mates that determine when and where and how uh, these key performance indicators will be met. So the problem we've got is, is that everyone wants to die, right? Sorry, everyone wants to go to heaven, no one wants to die. Oh, 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 oh. So that's the problem. And that, and, and that's, and that, is, the pro and that is the problem. The problem is that we just don't have enough uh, backbone in Kiwi society to say uh, 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 climate change is wrong. Uh, climate polluters and, cl and climate uh, changes have to change. And, and why, why should they pour more money into two political parties and get away with gay abandon? Totally incoherent. Uh, David, your follow-up question. <laughs> How, so let's talk about um, uh, agriculture. Right? So at the moment agriculture is not part of the, the ETS ignore the terrible language that Bummer was using, he's obsessed with um, um, that sort of stuff, but how, how do we get emissions from the agricultural sector into the ETS? Is that something we should do or is it we should kick down the road? Look, the idea of the ETS uh, was to change polluters, conducts and behaviours and, and do a risk and reward um, process. So why are they outside? So you think they should they should be in the farmers? Oh. The farmers should have to pay for the. Well, it's a bit like emissions. it's a bit like the wealth tax. If I'm paying 33 cents a, um, <clears throat> for my wage and salary, uh, anyone that release, anyone that releases wealth yeah. Yeah, should pay the same. I think you're on should 39. pay the same. So it's, it's it's exactly the same as in the emission trading area. Thank you, John. Jenny, there's more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere than at any other time in human history. We're accelerating down the path to exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, and statistics of the northern hemisphere are breaking daily with land temperatures, ocean temperatures, mass flooding, and unprecedented forest fires. Is New Zealand first serious about climate change? Because Winston seems to be more interested in putting toilet cops in public bathrooms to stop people of different genders using them. Is New Zealand First serious about the main issue of our time? Absolutely. I know you're a bit obsessed with your hooter and your banana, but <laughs> I think what you have missed out is that New Zealand First has a policy which we started when we were in coalition with Labour called the Billion Trees Program. And what this was was to start that process of mitigating our, our, our emissions. That is really important that we continue that but make sure we have the right tree in the right place. We don't want our productive agricultural land to be sold off offshore and be planted in pine trees. We need to keep going with our trees but also um, ensuring that the money that is inside the ETS that is there for adaptation uh, and climate change uh, purposes. For example, Fonterra have just uh, received $90 million out of that fund yep. so they can change their coal burner dryers for, for their uh, milk powder. We need to keep those initiatives going. We cannot raid that fund. Damien, your follow-up. What do you think of the plan um, uh, to take a, a, the money raised from the ETS and do it a dividend to all New Zealanders? Is, is that a good idea or should it just go to the provinces? No, we, sh we shouldn't be giving a dividend. It should be for adaptation. I think adaptation is really important as part of this climate change um, conversation that we're having. Uh, here's an example. The Provincial Growth Fund, they funded uh, the stock banks at Taradale. Now, the flooding that happened in Hawke's Bay, if those stock banks hadn't been built, 
uh, there would have been a lot worse issue from that, that massive flooding. So yes, we do need to make sure we have adaptation. Uh, and I'll just another one quick example. Um, up north Kaikowi had multiple years of absolute drought. You know, mums with their babies had to go down to the river to, to give them a wash. We had built with the Provincial Growth Fund, Matawi Dam. Willie, you went there at the opening. Um, and that will be a game changer for agriculture, for our horticulture, as well as the town of Kaikoui. Thank you, Jenny. Paul Goldsmith. Emissions reductions on agriculture were supposed to occur in 2003, yet corporate farming, with their political muscle, have ensured nothing has happened in 20 years. And National are promising a further five years where corporate farmers don't have to do anything. That's 25 years years of doing nothing. Can National be taken seriously on the climate, especially when your plan for transport is to build more roads and cut public transport? The time starts now. I, 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 I sure, Bono, that you're familiar with electric cars, um, and they go on the roads, uh, and uh, if the, the electricity that drives the electric cars comes from hydro and wind and solar, uh, they're not causing much problems for the climate and so uh, we're, we're, we're going to be allowing people to get around and, and it's a useful thing and we're sick of the flame, this government making us crawl around at 30 kilometres an hour and irritating us on the road. So yes, we're in favour of enabling people to get around on their roads. Uh, when it comes to um, climate change though, I mean, yes, half of our emissions are from the agricultural area. Now, uh, that's where we actually also make a living in this country, and so the most useful thing we can do is actually allow uh, technology to develop in this country so that you can develop the uh, rye grasses and things like that that can reduce the methane emissions from our cows. That's why we're going to uh, uh, move away from this ridiculously tight set of regulations we around uh, uh, generic um, uh, uh, works there so that we can actually get the science and technology uh, to be part of the solution to our emissions. Damien, your follow-up? Hang on, God, nobody cares about the environment. It's so boring. Um, uh, let's talk roads. Right? Yes. Steve, have you read Stephen Joyce's book? Yes. It is, isn't it fantastic? Tell us, uh, the one thing I saw in, the, in National's policy that made my heart sing just a little is you're bringing back the roads of national significance. Yes, yes that's right. Build, baby, build. Tell me the roads you're going to build. Well, uh, you, oh. well you, you might have noticed, some of you, Glorious. if you've driven south down to Cambridge, there's a beautiful road down to Cambridge. Beautiful. And it, it's fantastic. If you go north uh, through Poirier, another beautiful road. They used to call it the Holiday Highway, but it actually uh, goes north and, and also down in Wellington. We're going to keep extending those roads further and further so that ultimately we connect uh, Whangarei and Tauranga, half the population in New Zealand, connect them properly for the first time with a decent road. And that's basic infrastructure that any successful country needs to grow. I love, I love roads. Thank you, Paul. Willie Jackson, Helen Clark. Helen Clark first attempted an emissions target in 2003, but National drove a tractor up Parliament's step and freaked everybody out. 20 years later, and farmers still don't want to pay, Shame. while transport, which is our second largest emitter, faces backlash any time public transport is promoted. Farmers don't want to pay for the cost of climate change, and neither do drivers. How do you adapt to climate change when no one wants to pay for the adaptation? Well, we try to work with everyone, as you well know. You know, <laughs> we work with we work with we work with agriculture and here uh, Wakaeke Noa, and you know we might get some results back. We might get some results back from that tomorrow. Uh, we've, we we try to do an infrastructure uh, set up in terms of, of this and. National just want to take all the money in terms of infrastructure for their tax cuts. We try to uh, put a, together a, a, a budget in, in terms of uh, climate change. National want to take that budget. We've, we've, we've been involved with renewal, renewable energy. We're rolling out strategies everywhere. Uh, but it's really, really hard. You've got, you've got climate deniers in the National Party. Uh, one of them, I think, was on the news last week. In fact, you've got two or three climate deniers. You've got climate deniers in, 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 ACT, in the ACT Party. We're the only one. We're the only party with like a sensible strategy. You've already seen what we're going to do. Well, we've been rolling this out for some time, but it's hard to get a coordinated strategy when you've got nut jobs in the both of these parties. Maybe grant your response, please. All right. You know that. You know that. You know that. that was 60 yeah. seconds. A complete yeah. Yeah. You know that. Minister Jackson. What did you say? Minister, <laughs> Minister Jackson. Yes, David. How? How, for the love of all that is good, could you give $80 million 
Trebluski, what are you doing? This is, this is, look at these people. These people pay taxes for you to give to an Australian multinational. And for what? Justify your behaviour, Minister Jackson. Because we're thinking about the future, unlike you Act supporters uh, who have got no vision. This is a, a government with vision, and we will invest. But if I can, thank you, thank you, Willie. David Seymour, last decade, Act didn't believe in climate change, and you have a climate right. denier as a That's candidate right. That's who right. now says climate now deniers. Says he's a believer. While denying you or your candidates are climate deniers, you want to allow new gas and oil exploration. Does it matter if ACT or your candidates are climate deniers or not when your policy is in total denial? Which one sits down? Um, I don't know who wrote this stuff for you, but you should get your talent. Look, can I respond first to the previous segment? I wish that I was as powerful in reality as I am in Willie Jackson's mind. But the truth is... But, but, the, but, the but the truth is, it's not about me. It's not about no, it's me about, being smarter all, than all the courts you. or previous it's prime ministers. You. It is actually about a simple idea, yeah, universal right. human oh, rights and the idea that each of us are born alike in dignity. And what's more, it is true that every worthwhile change in the history of this country has occurred when every previous Prime Minister said keep doing what we've always done is the right thing. When the courts believed in the status quo, if we said because everyone did this in the past yeah, yeah. we shouldn't change, no we'd never them. make any no progress. So it's a silly argument. Yeah, yeah. Now, on pri now on climate change, look, it's very simple. New Zealand can either tax too much, put New Zealand farmers out of business, right. have people getting their protein from overseas, putting us, making our sales work. Hey, I got extra time here because they keep talking about me. Now, the, 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 here's, here's the next. You. Yeah, or we can actually do nothing and be pariahs and find that walls go up to New Zealand exports. We Thank have to get the Thank balance right, and the way to do we that. Must, we is must now wrap with our I final thought, word on the direction of New Zealand. Hang on, in, hang on, all, in all our polling data, the majority of voters believe New Zealand <coughs> is headed in the wrong direction. That's right. We have 25,000 people on the social housing wait list. That's we spend a right. million dollars a day keeping beneficiaries in motels. In terms in term four of last year, only 50.6 per cent of students were regularly attending class. 12 per cent of children live in low income households. 55 per cent of Kiwis are struggling financially. Home ownership is at its lowest rate in 70 years. We are facing the worst inflation rate in 30 years. And according to the Human Rights Commission, whom David will, you know, throw aside, off, more than 100,000 Kiwis face homelessness advocates. You each have a minute's closing statement. A minute. Why should voters, why should viewers vote for your party from the New Zealand We're First Party? Jenny Marcroft, your time starts now. Well, it's usually, you know, elections are usually like a pendulum. They, it swings to Labour and then it swings back to National. But I think what we've seen uh, in the latest polls is that actually it's going to be the, the smaller parties that are going to be uh, making a, a more of an impact at, at this election. And, 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 and if there is the opportunity, and if a New Zealand First is there, we have experience that we can bring to the cabinet table, which is going to be really important because if the country does swing to the right and we get uh, a potential Prime Minister who's never even been a cabinet minister, and if there's a pro uh, Deputy Prime Minister who's never been a cabinet minister, then there needs to be some experience at that table. And New Zealand First can offer that balance, it can offer that experience, and it can also offer the ability to turbocharge great ideas, but make sure we handbrake really dumb ideas that will take New Zealand off the track. So we want to make sure that we have Thank a you. balanced Thank and stable government. Thank you, Jenny. From the National Party, Paul Goldsmith, your time starts now. Well, thank you, uh, Bomber. And look, New Zealand cannot afford another three years of this government, uh, heading in the wrong direction on any front. Uh, the, the economy is in a recession. Uh, we're, we're struggling with the cost of living. As you say, the kids aren't going to school. We're not getting the health care that we need, and we can be doing so much better. And that's why, under National, we're going to get the country back on track under Chris Luxon's leadership. And what we want to do is we want to fix the economy by actually having a focus on productivity, getting inflation under control, putting some more money back into the pockets of the squeezed middle by giving some tax relief, 
Then we're going to fix, uh, we're going to restore law and order by having actually some real consequences for crime. Thirdly, we're going to actually have some decent health and education policies. Uh, a, by getting the kids to school, and in health it's going to be based on the basis of need, not who your grandparents are, and we're going to actually bring back some targets. You don't even know who your so grandparents that, are. Well, thank you. Hey, well, I know where my grandfather thank you, was. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. From the Labour Party, Willie Jackson, your time starts now. Look, I've been very clear, we're making a real impression as a government. I'm really proud in terms of a... <laughs> Can I have another minute? <laughs> Look, you know, we're rolling everything out. As I said, minimum wage, you know, you're scrapping the prescription charges. You know, we're putting a... We've got 100 million lunches, 100 million lunches in schools. Families are saving thirty-three dollars a week. These guys and these guys will get rid of everything. But even worse, they'll get rid of women's affairs. They'll get rid of Maori affairs, and, and they'll get rid of Pacific affairs because David Seymour wants to blow them up. You know. So here, that's the sad thing. Is I want a New Zealand for everyone. David wants to blow people up. We're in this game for everybody. We'll work for everybody. Uh, the reality is, reality is we're a safe government who will look after the nation, not just our rich mates like Goldie's mates and David Seymour. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Uh, David Seymour, you've got, nine, you've, got, you've got a minute. Go for it, buddy. Look, I don't know why Willie's talking about women's affairs. It's called the Ministry for Women. But putting oh, that sorry, aside, sorry. That putting that aside, uh, uh, this country is in a funk, so as I said at the start. And what Bomber has summed up is exactly oh. where we are after six years of Labour. What we need is real change. It can't just be That's Chris right. for Chris. It can't just be show up business as usual, but That's make right. sure you wear a blue tie. We've actually got to have a little bit of hope because there's going to be no shortage of fear. These guys cannot run on their record because their record is shot. That's why they're going to bring the fear, but we're going to bring the hope. Hope that we get some quality out of our tax dollars by driving performance in the public services. Hope that we actually do regulation properly so people aren't bogged down by red tape and regulation. Hope that it's safe to walk to the dairy and run a dairy in this country again because we start having consequences for criminals and rights for people who follow the law. And hope that our treaty becomes a document with a place for all rather than a source of division. Thank you. Thank you. From the, green, from the Green Party, Ricardo, go for it. Yeah, look, the, the, the time is now to rise up to the challenge of the day. It is no surprise that people are feeling like things are heading in the wrong direction because the major political parties have delivered very incremental change in our communities are calling for a complete transformation of our communities. And this is why the Greens are running on a platform to overhaul our tax system, expand the health services that our public health system provides, and deliver meaningful action on climate change that will actually address cost of living measures like reducing public transport fares and putting public transport infrastructure that works for our communities. We cannot afford to run a campaign solely on fear and what we have to lose under the alternative. We have to campaign on what is in there for our communities. And a final word to our hosts who represent taxpayers, I look forward to you joining us in our campaign to make it 16 and support our 16 and 17 year old taxpayers. Amen, amen. Okay, please, please. Come on, bring us home. Bring us home. John, your final word this evening, please. Yeah, Go for well, it. Well, um, look, look please, uh, at the right. end of the day, we are here forever as the Indigenous Party. <laughs> and no matter what happens. And, and what I need to say is you either respect the rule of law That's right. uh, or we don't have it. David, you don't swap. Now, if, if, if you're going to uh, treat us as some new breed that just arrived here That's right. and wipe out. Uh, our, rights, our rights, there will be trouble in this country, not it's because not we idea. want it, because we have practiced the rule of law over 183 years. If someone comes in and tries to run over That's our right. rights, they've made a declaration. That's I didn't. Right. I just want to make that very okay. clear. And so tonight, when you go to bed, 25% of all babies under five have Māori descent. Tonight, when you go to bed, 70% of all Māori are under the age of 40, 
and they'll either be positive and progressive citizens, and they'll be under our management, not yours. They'll live under our way of bringing ourselves up, not yours, and we'll have a far better nation. That's the way it's going to be. Comrades, comrades, that's the show. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this most important of civic duties, which is to vote. As I stated at the beginning, in an age of disinformation, misinformation and apathy, our democracy needs engaged citizens like never before. I think he's finished. Our thanks to the candidates, Gravity Credit Management, the Daily Blog, the Working Group, the Taxpayers Union, Courier Polling, Slipstream Media, the New Zealand Herald, and Juice TV Freeview for bringing this evening's debate to the live stream masses. We'll see you 7 p.m. next Tuesday for our next live stream debate from Northland, where we'll see if Shane Jones has a chance to win New Zealand first in the electorate seat this, this year. From the palatial, everybody's at Imperial House in the mighty Auckland city. Kia ora and kāpai, New Zealand. Right, right, right. 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 Right.